Thank you for that very generous introduction. And I thank the University of Minnesota for the opportunity to address this special group. I was fortunate enough to give the uh, commencement address at the College of Liberal Arts last May uh, here at the university. And at that time, I stressed to the graduates how their educations were designed to prepare them for a lifetime of learning. And I feel sure that that message would have resonated even more with this group. Indeed, you've left your warm homes <laughs> on a cold February night to engage in exactly that kind of lifetime learning, to hear about the economy and the Federal Reserve. And I want you to know that I also look forward to learning from you during our discussion that will follow my remarks. Now, I, I noticed that uh, Dean Nichols noticed, uh, mentioned that the second part of the presentation will be devoted to your questions. I will also try to provide some answers. <laughs> So my speech this evening will have two distinct parts. In the first part, I will discuss my outlook for the economy in 2011. And in the second part, I will look back in time to the Great Recession of 2007-2009. My discussion will parallel the classic Frank Capra movie, It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> and in that movie, the hero, George Bailey, is granted the miraculous opportunity to see how other lives would have been affected if he had never existed. I will do the same for the Federal Reserve. <laughs> I will describe how I believe the Great Recession of 2007-2009 would have unfolded had the Fed not existed. So as, I'm, as always, I'm speaking for myself today and not for others in the Federal Reserve or on the Federal Open Market Committee. So in my outlook, I'll focus on the three variables of most interest to us at the Federal Open Market Committee, what I'll call the FOMC from now on. And the, uh, the three variables I'm going to be talking about are real gross, gross domestic product, GDP, unemployment, and inflation. And my bottom line is that from the point of view of the macroeconomy, 2011 will be a better year than 2010. And last week, we learned that real GDP, which measures the nation's production of goods and services adjusted for inflation, grew at a 3.2% annual rate during the fourth quarter of 2010. Now that growth was slightly higher than the average growth of 2.8% during the year. That is from the fourth quarter of 2009 to the fourth quarter of, of 2010. So what this means is that output has finally recovered um, to its pre-recession level, that is to de its December 2007 level. It is 0.1%, in fact, above that level of output in the fourth quarter of 2007. However, we cannot celebrate too much. First, the population of the United States has grown about 2.6% from November 2007 through November 2010. So that means a real GDP per person is still 2.5% lower than it was in the fourth quarter of 2007. Also, historically, real GDP per person in the U.S. grows at roughly 2% per year. Now suppose that we would had that kind of growth over the past three years, from the end of 2007 through, through the end of 2010 then real GDP would actually be 8.5% higher in the fourth quarter of 2010 than it actually is. And as you will hear, I expect this 8.5% differential, where we normally would be as opposed to where we are now, I expect that differential to change little, if at all, by the end of 2011. So in this sense, the recession has had and will continue to have a large and persistent impact on the U.S. economy. Now, at the November 2010 FOMC meeting, participants submitted forecasts for real GDP growth in 2011. So the central tendency of these forecasts, which throws out the lowest three numbers and the highest three numbers, is that real GDP growth would be between 3% and 3.6% in 2011. Now, I should say, though, these forecasts were made before we knew about the tax changes for 2011 that ended up being instituted in December by, by, by Congress. Nonetheless, even with these December changes in fiscal policy, I would say that I expect real GDP growth will probably be closer to 3% than 4% in 2011. I still see two major headwinds in the U.S. economy. The first is that many households will continue to strive to rebuild their net worth positions in response to past and possibly future falls in residential land prices. As I will explain in more detail later, I believe that the decline in household net worth, 
precipitated by falls in land values, was a key factor in generating the severity of the Great Recession. And it will remain important in the recovery. So the, that's the first headwind, the net worth rebuilding. The second headwind is related. Many banks in the United States face ongoing issues with asset quality. For example, the FDIC problem bank list contains over 800 banks nationwide. Now, problem banks are less likely to take the risk of lending to small and or younger bank, or younger firms, I should say, or other forms of entrepreneurial activity. Instead, they are more likely to preserve capital ratios by limiting their asset growth and allocating their lending staff to working out loans to existing borrowers. And indeed, as, this, as the economy improves, I think this headwind, the headwind of the problem banks, uh, uh, will become even more important. In 2010, our information at the Minneapolis Fed indicates that small businesses were reluctant to expand because of ongoing uncertainties about product demand. As a result, their demand for bank financing remained low. But in 2011, as the economy improves, I expect loan demand to rise accordingly, but banks with poor asset quality are going to continue to focus on capital preservation rather than loan expansion. Now, that, that's the story on the GDP front. Turning to labor markets, the, labor, the unemployment rate fell to 9.4% in December from 9.8% in November. Now, any decline is welcome news, but I do not think this single data point signals a rapid recovery in labor markets. Employment growth remains disappointingly low. In fact, non-farm employment increased by only 103,000 in December. Now, I think it's very important to understand how unemployment fell by 40 basis points from November to December, even though employment growth was relatively low. Now, here it's helpful to recall how the Census Bureau goes about measuring unemployment. So every month, the Census Bureau goes around and interviews 60,000 randomly selected households consisting of about 110,000 individuals. The Bureau asks a host of questions to these households. But there are two particularly important ones. Uh, the first, have you worked for pay or profit in the past week? If not, have you looked for work in the past four weeks? So the first group that has worked for pay or profit in the past week is called the employed. The second group is counted as the unemployed, the ones who had, who had not had a job in the past week and have looked for work in the past four. Anyone who answers no to both questions is regarded as being out of the labor force. And the unemployment rate is defined to be the fraction of people in the labor force who are either employed or unemployed who are, in fact, unemployed. So this definition, which I've <laughs> uh, gone through quite tediously here, that, but that means that the unemployment rate can fall in two distinct ways. It can fall through unemployed people becoming employed. Alternatively, it can fall by unemployed people ceasing to look for work. And this second channel was significant in shaping the employment picture in December. In that one month, the labor force fell by 260,000 people, which is certainly a large move by historical standards. Now, the available data do suggest that most of the unemployed who left the labor force were young. So the number of people under the age of 25 in the labor force fell by 244,000 from November to December. So that first figure I said, the labor force fell by 260,000. Now the people under 25 of, in the labor force fell by 244,000. Now my hope and expectation is that many of these people will return to the labor force as the economy improves in 2011. But notice that'll actually put some, as they return and start looking for work, that'll actually put upward pressure on the unemployment rate as the economy improves. Nonetheless, I do not believe that either unemployment or employment will recover rapidly in 2011. Startup businesses and other key young firms are a key source of employment growth, especially in the early stages of recovery. And as I mentioned earlier, the, they are likely to find bank financing more challenging to obtain than usual. As well, 4.2% of the labor force has been unemployed for longer than six months. And historically, this group of workers, 
people who have been unemployed for over six months, has a low job finding rate. So for both these reasons, the headwinds in small firms obtaining financing and the fact that so many of uh, the labor, so many of the unemployed have been unemployed for a long period of time, I think it'll be relatively uh, take a lo relatively long time for the unemployment rate to fall. The central tendency of the November FOMC forecasts is that unemployment will remain above nine percent throughout 2011. Now I would agree with these forecasts. Even more troubling, I expect that unemployment is likely to be higher than eight percent as late as the end of 2012. Now, finally, I'll, uh, in terms of my outlook, I'll turn to inflation. Inflation was extraordinarily low in 2010. From the fourth quarter of 2009 through the fourth quarter of 2010, headline PCE, personal consumption expenditures inflation, was 1.2%. Now, what do I, when I say this term headline, I want to emphasize this measure includes both food and energy. But fluctuations in food and energy prices are typically transient and volatile. So for this reason, core PC inflation, that's inflation measured without food and energy in it, has historically been a better predictor of future headline PC inflation than headline PC inflation itself. So if you want to get a forecast what's going to happen to overall inflation, you're better off stripping food and energy away and then trying to forecast what's going to happen to overall inflation. Now once we do that, core PC inflation over 2010 was even lower, only 0.8 percent. Now these inflation levels are too low to be consistent with the usual formulations of the Fed's price stability mandate. More troubling than even just the level of inflation is that inflation fell substantially in 2010. So from the fourth quarter of 2008 through the fourth quarter of 2009, core PC inflation was 1.7 percent. So in the course of one year, inflation rates measured in terms of core inflation fell by 90 basis points. If we had a further deceleration of the same magnitude in 2011, we would actually see core PC inflation fall into negative territory. Now with that said, I'm optimistic that inflation will actually turn north in 2011. So our Minneapolis Fed forecasting model indicates that over the course of 2011, inflation will be around 1.5%. And we can get another reading by looking at the prices of financial instruments called zero coupon inflation index swaps. And the, the current prices of these, these are basically just bets on what the inflation rate is going to be. And the current prices of these imply that for the coming year, expected inflation will be roughly 1.7%. So to summarize, I expect real output to grow slightly more rapidly in 2011 than in 2010. But household deleveraging and bank asset quality will remain a drag on the recovery. Unemployment will fall, but much more slowly than we would like. Finally, as is suggested by financial market data, I am optimistic that inflation will be higher in 2011 than in 2010, while still remaining under 2%. Thank you.